now. The author of this new book, Shadow Strike, uh, examines the 2007 bombing of Syria's nuclear reactor um, and offers an insight into whether Israel might one day need to take action against Iran's nuclear facilities. Its author and editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, Yaakov Katz, joining me now live from Jerusalem. And reading as one uh, reviewer uh, put it like a spy thriller, uh, Newt Gingrich describing your book as remarkable, one of the most compelling stories I have read in a long time. Walk us through how you stack up what happened 12 years ago and what is going on now. Two very different situations and an attack 12 years ago on, on a Syrian facility would be a very different situation, wouldn't it, be uh, to, a, to an Israeli attack on, you know, fortified Iran, as it were. I think without a doubt, Becky, and that's 100 percent true. What happened 12 years ago is Israel discovered by chance almost that Syria was building together with the North Koreans this nuclear reactor in the northeast along the Euphrates River and had that small window, as you mentioned, to take out that reactor before it went hot, before it became active. And then a strike would have spread radioactive material throughout the region all cr across the Euphrates and would have been horrific. So Israel had that window and took it. The difference between then and now is that a everyone knows about iran it's been a challenge and a threat for the world for at least almost two decades with its nuclear program two is the fact that in syria and in 1981 when israel bombed the oc rack reactor outside of baghdad that saddam hussein was building those were two single facilities both in iraq and in syria above ground that weren't heavily defended mm. weren't heavily fortified in Iran, you have facilities spread across the country, and some of them, like the Natanz main uranium enrichment facility, is, is deep underground behind concrete and steel. So it makes a, a regular conventional airstrike a bit more complicated than what we've seen in the past. You have uh, clearly spent an awful long time researching this book. The, the crits, I have to say, are, are, are glowing. How do you then consider what is going on and uh, infer what or, or, and what can you offer so far as sort of in, <laughs> intelligence is concerned as to uh, what is going on today and how the US and Israel are trying to work out what happens next with regard to Iran. Well, I think as we saw and during the, the, the work on this book, I, I spoke with everyone on the Israeli side who was involved, everyone on the US side who I could get to who was involved. And what I was able to see was just how close the U.S.-Israel alliance really is. We, we often hear about how it's unshakable, unbreakable, but behind that veil, behind that curtain, you really get to see what was said in those closed-door meetings between the president and the prime minister, the head of the CIA or the head of the Mossad, the head of the IDF, the Israeli army, and the U.S. military. And, and you see how it really works. So, so two things that I could say about what's happening now. One is that that's even more so today. That relationship has only grown and become stronger. And, and even under President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu, who both have troubles, let's say, domestically, when it comes to their relationship, it's extremely close, as we all know and we all see. And we can imagine just how intimate they're working together on the Iranian challenge. But the second piece of that is, is that Israel, I think, would prefer for there to be a new deal. And that seems to be what the Trump administration is trying to get out of the Iranians. And I think we're seeing that de-escalation right now is to negotiate a new deal that would prevent the Iranians from ever being able to break out to a nuclear bomb. But the last thing is that Israel has proven not once, but twice, in 1981 in Iraq and in 2007 in Syria, that when needed, it knows how to use military force to remove a threat that it views to be of an existential nature. That's what it did in Shadow Strike when it took out the Syrian reactor. And I think that if it comes to it, if one day down the road, and we're not yet there, Becky, but if one day it does come to mm. it and Israel does fear that the Iranians are close, they will take military action to prevent them from getting that nuclear weapon. Call me, says Trump. I mean, look, we know that that is not likely, uh, but do you believe it is more likely that any deal were a sort of a diplomatic narrative to be carved out at this point would be between the US and Iran, for example, leaving the Europeans, the Russians and the Chinese out this time? 
Look, I think it's possible. I think one of the problems right now with the 2015 deal is that even though the U.S. pulled out, everyone else has pretty much stayed in. And that's why the Iranians haven't felt so much pressure. But now with the waivers on the oil deals and all the energy all right. sanctions that have also been put in place by the U.S., that start to, to they're starting to feel that on the streets of Tehran and across Iran. And also the European countries are starting to think twice before they start to do business with the Iranians like they were since 2015. So I think it's possible that the Iranians would be able to reach a new deal with the, with the Americans. I don't think anyone has an interest in, in a war right now. Iran in particular, if there's one thing that interests them the most, it's the survival of the regime. And you'll remember, Becky, in 2003, when America was building up its forces ahead of the invasion of Iraq before that war, Iran suspended its entire nuclear program. Why? At least in Israel, and among in the intelligence circles here, there was a feeling and an understanding that the Iranians thought that they might be next in line, that Bush had gone to the Taliban in Afghanistan, he was taking out Saddam in Iraq, and now he was going to go off after the Iranians. And the Iranians thought that, and therefore sure. they put the brakes on everything. So you see that when there's a credible military threat on the table, the Iranians are rational actors, and that seems to be what the strategy is right now. Build up those forces, the USS Lincoln Strike Force, the B-52 bombers, get them in the region, show the Iranians that you're not just talking, you're also holding a big stick. That might be enough to get them to come back to the table and renegotiate a deal. The U.S. president says he isn't looking for war. We know he is looking for a peace deal within uh, between the... Israelis and Palestinians, and we are expecting to see the details of uh, Jared Kushner's uh, plan um, anytime soon. A few weeks ago, Oman's foreign minister told me that relations with Israel are normalized and he's not alone. Have a listen to the UAE's Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, Anwar Gargash, speaking to me just before the weekend. On the one hand, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue uh, is long overdue. The Palestinians deserve an independent state with Jerusalem as a, East Jerusalem as its capital. The Israelis also deserve uh, their secure state in the region. I think this is what we have uh, we have learned. It is very important to do it because we've seen over the years that our current approach that uh, many of the Arab states have taken for many, many years has only, uh, has, has not worked purely. Ahead of uh, the details of this plan, as everyone tries to second guess what Jared Kushner um, is likely to present, do you believe the Arabs have changed their tune? Look, I think there is a change. You, you hear it, you see it, you saw Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit to Oman just a couple months ago which seemed historic at the time. We know that there's a lot going on behind the scenes between the Saudis and the other Gulf states with Israel in an unprecedented way. It might not be overt above the surface, but it's there. And I think that they would like to take it to the next stage and the next level, but they have their public opinion also that they need to worry about. And, and that's what's holding back a lot of this. The people in the streets of those countries are not yet ready to see their countries and their governments normalize those ties in an official capacity while this conflict still seemingly exists. Although, on the other hand, I'm not going to hold my breath for this deal uh, to come through, as they call it in, uh, you know, the deal of the century. I don't know how they're going to get the Palestinians to come back to the table. There, there's complete disconnect between Ramallah and Washington at the moment. And unless they have some wild card up their sleeve, it, it'll be difficult to see how this all comes together. But definitely, there is a change in the region. And the reason that change is taking place is because I think the Gulf states understand today that the real threat, the real challenge, it's not Israel, it's the Iranians, and they need to work with Israel to counter the Iranians. Israel is a pillar of stability in the Middle East. They know what Israel did back in 2007 with Syria, taking out that reactor. They know what it did with Saddam's reactor in 81. They know how Israel is fighting against the Iranians and trying to undermine their capabilities. They know they need to work with the country. And that's why you're seeing this change of tone right now. Well, that's the view of Mr. Katz of the Jerusalem Post. So thank you very much indeed for joining us.